Hello everybody and welcome to this webcast. My name is Paul Vincent. Uh, my role in Kelly OCG is to uh, twofold really. One is I manage our overall go-to-market strategy uh, around what we call talent supply chain management uh, and I'm also the center of excellence lead for our contingent portfolio. The purpose of this webinar is really to act as a, as a reprise of a couple of presentations that I've delivered recently to a procurement audience. One at the Parser Confex exhibition last week in Melbourne, and then previously uh, an event that was to place at ProcureCom uh, in Amsterdam. On both occasions, I shared some experiences that I had from working around effectively the talent management table. Um, the three areas we're going to cover today, one is I'm going to talk about the generic total management landscape and some of the nuances which are going on today. I'm also going to cover the difference between efficiency and effectiveness when it comes to buying in this area of spend. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some ideas about how procurement can really maximize the influence and impact in this area. Now, as I mentioned, the rationale for this is that I've got a, a range of experiences uh, built from a, a 30 year plus career where I really have played a, a very strategic and tactical and operational role across all manner of different uh, roles within the talent management space. Um, on a spend management basis, I was the global procurement director for over one billion of, uh, of Australia dollars worth of labor spend. Uh, I've also managed huge teams and cliented big, broad projects. And so one of the things that I've often had, uh, before my, my Kelly life, I was a consultant as well, and, and I was often asked to, to share some of the things that go on behind the curtain, if you like. And so that's really what I'm going to try and do, is, is bring you to the surface some of the things that you may not realize, and certainly the things that I would love to have known when I was a procurement director. So let's dive straight in. Well, the first thing I would say is that we're definitely in uncharted territory. There's so much change going on within the industry. And there are a couple of key elements of that change. One is the whole basis of the world of work changing. So you can see some of the, the issues there. You've got this whole question about what do you manage locally, what do you manage globally, and that tends to change often over time. And there'll be multiple different models within certainly of the large organization that um, spans the globe. Every organization is now trying to become as agile and lean as possible, and we are very much sort of seeing that as in, within our client base and also you know, within a different industry verticals where the, the cycle of economic activity meant that you know, you've on one level got companies that really paired themselves back significantly during the, the crisis and need to build out from there. Uh, and you've got other organizations that perhaps haven't really been faced with as much competition uh, as they have done now, so they're having to, to operate in, in ways that they weren't uh, particularly expecting or are not necessarily used to yet. And all that makes a difference to the blend of a workforce uh, and how that workforce is, is constructed and managed. There's been a, a definite shift to outcomes in the last four or five years. Certainly, when I think back to my time uh, as a global procurement director, it was one of those things that we really were pushing for, but it hadn't really taken too much effect that the that the consumers of the talent were really thinking about the, the outcomes they wanted in the level of detail that you would expect them to, and certainly the level of detail that is, is happening now. Uh, every part of the world is, is seeing changes and shifts in its uh, policies, compliance, and legal frameworks, and that all needs to be um, sort of <laughs> visibly maintained. You've got the whole area of the gig economy, which is often talked about in a as a big amorphous block, but you've got two key spectrums. You've got the, um, the sort of knowledge workers who are very much trying to use that as a way of, of managing their lifestyle. You know, they are doing um, smaller pieces of work, and they are very selective over what they do. And often, you know, these, these is talent that will only work in this arena. And then the other end of the spectrum, you've got people who can only earn if they operate in that uh, type of economy, and that's where you have issues such as zero hours contracts and things like that. And then finally, you've got the generational issues that are going on today, which are obviously having an enormous impact on the culture 
uh, and the approach that organizations are taking. So the new world of work is marrying with a new world of technology. Now, I'm not going to go through all those in that individually because you will be familiar, I'm sure, with how technology is impacting your organization and your industry. But obviously, the key thing that that leads it to is there's a lot more self-service opportunity and the availability of talent is much more ubiquitous. Um, so whether it's uh, human cloud platforms for particular niche skills or it's sort of huge, big procurement platforms that have got um, you know, plugs out to sort of different specialist applications, this arena is changing all the time. And how do you stay on top of that? Now, as a procurement function, as a procurement category lead, then it's often hard for you to stay on top of things that are going on in your own organization, let alone what's going on outside in the market. And with all of these different variables at play, it's often hard to really understand what good looks like for your organization. So what are the things that, that you see? Well, um, I've, there are five things I'm going to go through. The first three are things which um, you know, I'm sure you would agree with me. And the last two are things that you maybe um, would like to challenge me on. But we'll, we'll do the first three first. So the first one is options. Now, your options are multiplying all the time. Now, what I mean by that is that resources can be now obtained through so many different um, uh, avenues that you wouldn't normally expect. I remember two examples in my consulting mm -hmm. career pre-Kelly. One is I used to work with a, a company that provided print solutions. They provided engineers. Now, those engineers would contract directly with their end customer. So they were effectively providing that expert talent, um, expertise, to their customer. They weren't using it as part and parcel of extension of their service. Another example is an accounting firm I used to work with who created a job board specifically for their clients. So they didn't have to tap into the staffing marketplace directly. They were acting as an intermediary for their customers to add more value to their service. So these are just two examples of a market that's becoming hugely fra fragmented um, and, and, and really magnified in terms of uh, a choice. Now, if you look at that picture carefully, you'll see the two vertical lines. Now, um, if you, you, optically, um, they don't look the same size, but if you look carefully, they are the same size. Now, that picture is, is really meant to indicate that in the market today, there are what I would call a lot of optical illusions. These are things that are made to look different, which are otherwise the same. And the staffing industry, the workforce solutions industry, has got terminology coming out of its ears. In fact, I saw the last staffing industry analyst lexicon printed out very recently, and it was almost a centimeter thick. Now, that really does uh, make it very complicated, again, for a, for a buying organization to really distill the difference in these things. What really is uh, alternative solutions and alternative ways of doing things? And how do you really tease through between the, the spin, if you like, and the, and the reality? And the final point here is, is the, the third one is that there's a difference between a mess and a problem. Now, that is obviously a mess. Uh, I was my office. I hasten to add. Um, but it's only a problem if you can't find something at the important moment. Now, why am I, am I using that as an analogy? Well, because Many contracts, certainly in the MSP space, start off with a mess. That people don't know what they're spending, with whom, on what. And so the first part of a project is, if you like, to, to clean that up uh, and to see the, you know, the wood from the trees. Now, there's a lot of assumptions made if you're starting from that point. And one of the main assumptions is that there's loads of savings to be had. Well. Until you actually get under the skin of what's truly addressable, you might actually be putting an awful lot of redundancy into a program, spend which you think is expected to go through, but actually it doesn't in, uh, you know, in, in practice. And so what I would urge you to do is, is instead of starting off with uh, um, you know, the complete spectrum, is try and you know, look at how you can do some piece pieces of work to really identify what should be going into a program at the outset. You certainly reduce the cost of, of implementation, but also make sure that whichever service provider you use, they're starting off from a position of optimal success as opposed to perhaps assuming they can do things when in fact it's going to be very hard to do that. 
So I said that three were things that you would see and two you might. Well, here are the two you might not necessarily agree with me on. But I guarantee you from looking both ends of the spectrum, this is true. There is this assumption, uh, and I'll put it this way, that, you know, that the industry lives in a monetary. You know, there's always room for manoeuvre in terms of margins, in terms of the uh, amount of money that the, the agencies are prepared to reduce to, that the talent is prepared to work for. And what I would often see is that there isn't enough understanding of what the tipping point are and what those variables are that actually make an individual decision. And so rather than assuming that the best way to make savings is through what you're paying, it really is the case that there's many more savings to be had if you look at how you're actually buying and looking at the demand pattern, look at the way you're structuring uh, projects if it's statement of work, look at the way you're deploying talent, the way you're onboarding and offboarding talent, what they're there to do. That's where the real savings are as opposed to just what you're actually paying on the, the bill rate. And then number five is around this idea that I, I, you know, I call it a privilege to serve, but it's, like, it's about the fact that your organization has a value proposition, both for potential employers, employees, and also as potential uh, customers. And you want to make sure that people want to work for your organization because you are one of the best games in town. Uh, and I often find there's a bit of blindsiding here that you presume that you are uh, more attractive in the market than sometimes you may be. And so it's making sure you're not blindsided by that. So when you do uh, approach a type of talent or a type of service provider, you know, you've got your eyes open in terms of your attractiveness to them. Now in the labor category, traditionally, um, efficiency is the dominant mentality, and that is because it's about what are we spending, get more control over what we're spending, and that control will lead to higher cost savings. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's only one part of the jigsaw puzzle. And if you look at the buying process, where you've got at the front end planning what you're looking to achieve, then you engage the right provider or the right talent, then you perform the work, and then you learn the lesson from that work, what you find is that the traditional focus of the labor category lead tends to be that box two. It's all about engage. Now, if you want to move from efficiency to effectiveness, then you need to start looking across all four bases. So rather than just focusing on the visibility control and savings, you're making sure that you integrate all four stages and as a function, you're influencing all four. But fundamentally, that means you change from being a more of a gatekeeper of the process for your stakeholders internally to a real driving force, a facilitator of the process. Let me explain it to you this way. That every organization, it doesn't matter what organization they are, every time they change something, it will have some degree of impact on their resourcing strategy. And they have three choices. They either hire people in, you buy. You either create capability and develop that capability in-house, you build. Or you borrow, which is you hire on-demand resources from a multitude of different um, avenues. Now, that buy, build, borrow equation is effectively your talent supply chain. And every organization has got a talent supply chain. It only differs in size, complexity, and geography. But when you're looking at that decision, You've also got to bear in mind four key objectives, which is quality, speed, compliance, and value or cost. Now, those four are present in every single decision, but only one can really dominate. You can't have all four at the same uh, level, if you like, which means if you want to go for quality resource, you're going to have to compromise perhaps on speed, perhaps on value, because you need to pay more and wait longer the right resource. If you want speed, then you may have to compromise on value. You need to pay more, perhaps, to get that resource in. So you can see through those two examples of how that blend is critically important. And obviously, that blend and how you deploy those different variables will then lead you to the outcomes that you require as a business. 
So whether you want to improve customer satisfaction or you want to get faster to market or you need to drive into new product areas. These are the sort of things that you need to understand how your decision about what resource you deploy will apply to those four variables. Talent supply chain management is all about how do you make that work. So we've called out six areas of what we call good practice. These are things which are present in lots of internal and external processes. So the resource and strategy is all about how do you want to blend your your talent, your pool. Managing demand is prioritization. Now, how do you gate that through the organization? How do you guide people in terms of what type of talent is required for different types of outcome? What does good look like in terms of the financials? Um, and this isn't about necessarily the lowest price. This is about what does what does the market rate look like? What influences that market rate? And, and again, how able are you to influence that for your organization? Supply market knowledge, making sure you have access to the best of the best suppliers in any given scenario. Having a process and governance approach in place which really does line things up between the input and the output required. And analytics to oversee that process. So you really are looking down the line of sight and tracking the success measures every step of the way. And that's effectively what talent supply management is all about. Now, how do you take that insight as a procurement professional and really drive that into your organization as effectively as possible? The first thing I would share with you is that, you know, I'm going to use the expression there, obedience is for, is for dogs. What I mean is that you don't want suppliers who are subservient. You don't want people who are just going to be measured against the same thing. And I often encounter this on the other side of the table now where companies will say, well, you know, MS, every MSP provider is the same. Well, when you're requiring people to fill out the same spreadsheet, to be compared on the same cells, to be compared on the same variables, there's very little latitude to actually demonstrate that difference. So I would urge you to, to liberate, not strangle. And um, as you're going to market and you're eliciting information from the supply base, you provide as much opportunity as possible for them to showcase their differences. And don't try and you know, compare everything down to you know, the, the, the common denominator. I know that flies in the face of some you know, classic procurement um, theology, um, but if you want innovation, you have to create the environment for that innovation. And that doesn't happen often enough. The more you can keep some things simple for the market, the more likely you are to get better value. The more you put into the cost of sale, the less scope there is for commercial goodwill in negotiations. Now, I use the um, example when I presented this the last couple of events about a company I worked with who issued an RFI questionnaire that had more than 140 questions in it. But when I asked them how many they actually took notice of, the answer was 15 or 20. Yeah, they created that huge cost on themselves as well as they did the suppliers to actually complete that just in case. Well, that does nobody any good. So try and keep things simple. And within programs, you know, when you think about the cost of implementation, the cost of management, the more you can help and the more you are invested in actually helping to keep that as low as possible, the more you are going to benefit commercially. But you need to be more invested than just keeping things simple. You need to think that your involvement can make the difference, not just in terms of success of a particular engagement or a program of work, but also that intelligence that you get through watching something through the cycle can then be put into the front end of the buying process in a lot more uh, structured way. So you are then the go-to team, the go-to people for knowledge and insight in what actually works? Who knows our organization? Who actually does uh, go in with a scope of work that has to iterate a number of times? Who gets it right first time? Who doesn't? These are things which are more, uh, you have to watch and experience. These are things that are very hard to, to, to actually note in a remote way at the end of a program. So the more invested you are in going beyond just doing the deal, 
the more insight you will have to input into the end-to-end -end process. Limit the need for telepathy. Um, the more you share, the more value you're going to get. Um, think of it this way. Um, when you go to the market and you say, I'm buying from experts, I want you to tell me what I need to do. Well, your service providers are going to be expert in their industry, in their products and services, but they're not going to be expert in your company. And that's what you need to help them with, this translation between their knowledge of the possible and where they've helped other people, how to translate that into your business. And so the more you share about the landmines, who's, who's involved, who's not involved, who needs to be persuaded, who's already a persuader, who will always be a detractor, the more you're going to make sure that the proposal you get and the plan that you get is going to be built around success. If you leave those sort of hurdles unseen, if you like, then you're introducing unnecessary delay, unnecessary cost, which will ultimately rebound on the success of what you're trying to achieve. The final thing is to live in commercial reality. Now, the um, I've often wondered that the MSP fee structure is just um, so it's just counterintuitive. You know, the more successful that companies are in driving savings down, the less they earn. So I'm not quite sure how the suppliers are supposed to be incentivized in that model. Now, clearly, um, there needs to be a balance here. Um, but I would urge you to understand, you know, work out exactly how much your supplier is earning out of a particular program. Convert that to the level of investment you're expecting them to make. Is that a reasonable return? Is there enough scope in there to invest additionally in deriving more value? Is this a cooperative approach or is it a one-way approach? Now, every organization is different and every situation is different. Every program is designed in a different way. But the more realistic you are, about what your suppliers can invest in and how collaborative you make that conversation. Again, the more likely you are to get true value. So this is a summary of some of the key points. I'd like to leave you with uh, a couple of key takeaways. Uh, takeaway number one is, is a story that I originally found in a, in a book written by two brothers called um, uh, Switch, Why Change is Hard. And it's written by two brothers called Chip and Dan Heath. Now, the thrust of this story is that people make decisions to change based on feelings rather than data. Now, in a procurement environment, data is obviously a key proponent of uh, building the business case, uh, and often data is hard to get. But they cited this example of a company where they spent an awful lot of money on gloves, and the head of procurement created a, a database of all the different types of gloves and how much the different prices were and where the different suppliers were. And there was a huge amount of opportunity for savings. Sent that spreadsheet into the execs and asked them to really commit to supporting a cost-out program. It got no response whatsoever. So in order to make them feel that change, what he did was he got hold of a, copy, a pair of every single pair of gloves that they bought. He tagged the price on that and the name of the supplier. He then piled them high across the table, the exact boardroom table to be exact. He invited all the execs in. They saw this big mountain of gloves, and of course it was, well, what on earth is this? By making them feel, rather than look at data, it automatically propelled them into action. And as a result, that glove table was taken around the organization, and it drove change, and of course the, the outcome is how you would expect much more of a commercial approach. The second takeaway is I can't overestimate the importance that you play. It's your level of ambition, your level of understanding, your level of awareness, your level of determination, your degree of questioning, your desire to make the program stand out in your organization. These are things that really do make the difference. And all I can do is urge you using some of the thoughts that I've put across to really make the biggest difference that you can. I hope you found this useful. If you want to know more information about talent supply chain management, 
then uh, I've given you a link there to our website. There's a couple of things on there which you would like, maybe like to see. There's a video and, and a white paper. But if you'd like to email about anything that you've heard, then, then please do. I'd be delighted to, to talk more. If you want to know more about Kelly in the region, then please reach out to Ashmal. He heads up the, um, the BD area here, and he can talk to you more specifically about how Kelly OCG may be able to help your organization to drive better value out of your talent management and, and hopefully you know, take a, a more competitive approach to talent management so that it does make you stand out amongst your customers and amongst your competitors. So with that, thank you very much for listening and I hope you found it useful.